Greetings, welcome to the pre-concert talk for Magnificent Brass. This features the brass and percussion section of the Victoria Symphony. I'm obviously excited for this one, and in fact I might actually talk a little bit more than I usually do because this uh, repertoire is uh, something that may be unfamiliar to our regular audiences. So, this concert will be aired on Thursday, November 26th. Now, I've heard a brass ensemble concert once described as the musical equivalent of caffeine, and I love that analogy. It certainly wakes you up and gets you going. Now, this program is interesting in that it basically goes in reverse chronological order. What I mean by that is we start with three original works from the 20th century written specifically for a modern symphonic brass ensemble, and one of these is a nod to the 19th century style of writing. Then we perform two arrangements of music that was written during the Baroque era, an earlier era. And then we finish with the earliest works, two works by the Venetian composer Giovanni Gabrielli. These last two are actually the two earliest pieces we're performing, if you arrange them in the order of their date of composition. Now, I could go on forever about each of these pieces, but I'm just going to tell you very quickly uh, one or two interesting things about each. We start with Aaron Copland's Fanfare for the Common Man. This was written in 1942. Unfortunately, that was back in a time when we used a gender-specific noun to refer to all of humanity. Now, the first three notes of this piece are kind of unmistakable, played by the trumpets. That Ba -da -da. Now, I think the thing that makes this piece so effective from a brass player's perspective is that it uses notes that are part of the natural physics of brass instruments. All brass instruments produce a series of notes on a single length of tubing. We call this the harmonic series. And they're all mathematically related in that they're all fractions of the length of the tube we're blowing into. And these first three notes of Copland are part of that series. Now the other thing that makes these opening notes so effective is that the intervals these notes form are a perfect fourth, a perfect fifth, and an octave between the two outer notes. Now these are the foundations of a lot of our harmony in music. Just about every chord is built around a fifth and a repeated octave somewhere. So it's like we're laying the foundation for the harmony that follows as each group of instruments come in. It's a very effective piece, the fanfare for the common man. Interestingly, it was from a set of 18 fanfares. They were all written for the Cincinnati Symphony, all in 1942. And they're all on wartime themes. It's far outstripped its wartime context to have a much more universal appeal. The next thing on the program, the second thing on the program, is this fellow here, Carl Husa. He was a Czech-American composer. He emigrated to the United States in 1954. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner. He's particularly remembered for his contributions to the repertoire for wind instruments. Now, the Divertimento, which is the name of the piece we're performing, it's inspired in places by the folk music of his homeland, especially the second and the fourth movements. It will remind you here and there of other composers from that part of the world, like Bedrich Smetana or Leos Janacek. The third piece on the program is a tribute to the 19th century composer Anton Bruckner, it's a piece written in the style of one of his choral motets. It's simply called Etude for the Low Brass, and it was written by a trombonist named Enrique Crespo. Now, he's originally from Uruguay, and he made his career in Germany playing in a couple of different orchestras there. Crespo is the co-founder of an ensemble of brass players from various parts of Germany called simply the German Brass. Now they're pretty famous in our world as brass players and I highly recommend uh, looking them up. 
From there we go to two arrangements of pieces that were originally written for another instrument or combination of instruments. Now brass players are notorious for stealing music from other genres, mainly because it gives us the opportunity to play music that we otherwise wouldn't get to play. But also because some genres just lend themselves to this back and forth sharing like this. For example, organ music. Now an organ, I don't want to insult organists here, but an organ is in some ways a big wind ensemble controlled by one person, in a way. And organists have made some amazing transcriptions of orchestral works. A brass ensemble, and again I don't want to insult brass ensembles, we're really a lot like big organs but with multiple players. So we have borrowed from the organ repertoire for the next piece on the program, which is a chorale prelude by J.S. Bach. And it's called, Ich ruf zu dir, Herr Jesu Christ. I call unto you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now this was arranged by the same fellow who wrote the Bruckner Etude, which was the previous piece we played, Enrique Crespo. And for that, he wrote it specifically for that group that I mentioned at the German Brass. Now the other transcription, the other arrangement that we're doing, was made originally for two brass quintets. It was a joint project of our own Canadian brass, and you'll remember that they performed with the Victoria Symphony back in December of 2019, if you can remember that far back, and the brass quintet from the Berlin Philharmonic. Now this is a two-choir setting of the Magnificat. Now you, this was originally written for two choral groups. Now all of you who attend choral evensong services at the cathedral will be very familiar with this text. Uh, this music is by a composer named Charles Theodore Pachelbel. And yes, if the name Pachelbel rings a bell, see what I did there? Uh, Charles Theodore is the son of the famed Johann Pachelbel who wrote the Canon in D, which if you'll know that piece if you've been to a wedding in the last 50 years. By the way, the brass section of the Victoria Symphony is performing the canon on our next concert, which will be aired at Christmas time, so stay tuned for that. Now, incidentally, Charles Theodore Pachelbel was one of the first European composers to emigrate to what was then the American colonies. He settled in what is now known as Charleston, uh, uh, Virginia. Um, he was obviously uh, not born Charles Theodore, it was Carl Theodore in German, but they anglicized his name when he moved to the U.S. Now the Pachelbel is a piece of antiphonal music. What that means is it's music performed by two groups. They're either alternating or they're otherwise responding to each other. Now that brings us to the final works on the program by the Venetian composer Giovanni Gabrieli. And here is a picture of him strumming on a lute. Now, Gabrielli directed music at St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, and he often placed two or sometimes three groups of instrumentalists and singers in the space inside the church, a considerable distance apart. This was before social distancing was a thing, and he wrote in this antiphonal style. It was highly influential and musicians from throughout Europe studied with Gabrielli, notably the German composer Heinrich Schütz, who undoubtedly influenced the Pachelbel Magnificat setting that we performed earlier on this concert, as well as composers like J.S. Bach. The Gabrielli pieces we're performing are from a collection called Sacre Symphonie, which literally means sacred symphonies. And they're important not only because of the antiphonal style, but because they were very influential pieces of writing for the brass instrument family of the time. Um, the brass instruments of Gabrielli's day were quite different from our modern brass instruments. Um, since 1820, we've taken advantage of valves. That's the technology that allows you to very quickly change the length of the instrument to produce a wider variety of notes. Now back in Gabrielli's day, trumpets and horns, as we know them, didn't have valves. They used trumpets without valves, mainly for ceremonial type music, so fanfares or signals. But for music where you were doubling voices, 
or strings or other winds or organs or whatever, you really only had two brass instrument groups, the trombones, and this is what they looked like back in that day. Here's a picture of uh, the trombone family from that day. They came in different lengths. In the English-speaking world, these were called sackbuts. And the other group of instruments were these group, uh, were these instruments. They were the cornetti, and this is what they looked like. Cornetti had mouthpieces very similar to a trumpet mouthpiece, but the resonator part is made of wood, not brass. It's made of wood and it's covered in leather or parchment, and the different notes are achieved with finger holes like a flute or a recorder. Now it's very easy to confuse the cornetto with the cornet. And this is a cornet. It has valves and it's a later instrument. Um, a cornetto is also a kind of pastry and it's not to be confused with a coronet which is either a crown or a type of an automobile. So what I did is I ended up making this handy meme to help you distinguish cornets from cornetti and coronets. So this is all of those things. This is how to tell all of those things apart. So you can have a good laugh at this. Um, I've shared this on my Facebook page many times. Now the cornetto has undergone a revival in the last few decades because of the interest in historically informed performance practice. That's sometimes referred to as simply the early music revival or the period instrument revival. So you can hear these pieces now as close as we can guess to what they sounded like in Gabrielli's time. And if you want to hear these in this context, I would highly recommend this recording by the Gabrielli Consort and Players, or anything by this group, uh, Concerto Palatino. So look up either of those two uh, entities on the internet when you're finished watching this video. The popularity of Gabrielli in the brass player's repertoire has a lot to do with the fellow who transcribed these works for use with modern brass instruments, and that's this guy holding this rather strange uh, two-belled euphonium. Now his name was Robert King, and I'll venture that if you're not a brass player, you have no idea who he was. But I've saved him for the last part of this talk, because really this program would not have been uh, would not have been possible if not for people like Robert King. He was one of the first people to create a publishing company dedicated to music for brass instruments, and it started with a lot of his and others transcriptions of early music like Gabrielli and other Baroque composers. He also encouraged commissions of new compositions, and he became a sort of a clearinghouse for distributions from publishers of brass music from around the world. So works like the Husa Divertimento that we played earlier on this program and other original works for brass were really made known to the wider public through the efforts of people like Robert King and his catalog. But perhaps the crowning achievement came in 1969 when Columbia Records recorded an entire album of King's Gabrielli transcriptions with no less than three major brass sections from U.S. orchestras. The Chicago Symphony, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and the Cleveland Orchestra. Now this is a favorite album among brass players, and I highly recommend it to you if you don't know it. It is really the fantasy football all-star team of brass players. Chances are that any, and I emphasize that word, any professional brass player you will meet in North America, including myself, was either a direct student or of one of the brass players on that album, or a student of a student of one of those brass players. So we kind of come full circle with the Gabrielli at the end of this concert, because not only is it part of the historical roots of our place in music history. It's also the revival of Gabrielli that sparked interest in brass ensembles in particular, and thus made the rest of this program possible. So stay tuned for our next brass concert, which will be our Christmas Pops concert for 2020, with arrangements by 
our Principal Pops conductor, Shauna Lachlan. Until then, 